Okay. Well, hello to you at home. Um, I know any number of you have been missing classes for various reasons. I know some were quarantined. You haven't been able to be here. And we were thinking of Zooming, but rather than doing oh, three or four different Zoom classes, we're going to go back to what we did last spring, and we will meet here, and we will record, and we'll put it on our website. So when you're able to, you can go there, you can watch the lesson, it'll be done, okay? And hopefully we can get you caught up, and then you can get back to class when you're able to. We have Jaden here for now, so he and I will be doing the reading, and we'll be doing the practicing. You can read along if you'd want. You can speak along if you'd like with the homework that we're going to be doing. Let's begin with a prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we ask that you would be with us as we study your word. Send your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts to help us so that we will believe and follow everything that you tell us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, the memory work we had assigned for this class. We'll take a look at that, all right? We will speak some things together. We started with the, fir the third commandment, not its meaning, but the commandment. So we'll say it together twice. Ready? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And then passages. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. One more time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Exodus 20, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. One more time, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. Then Old Testament books, uh, we'll say them twice, we're in the middle here with Old Testament books, ready? Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. One more time. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Then we have the first article, and we will read through that. Ready? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God made me in all that exists and that he gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind, and all my abilities. And I believe that God still preserves me by richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, food and drink, property and home, spouse and children, land, cattle, and all that I own, and all that I need to keep my body and life. God also preserves me by defending me against all danger, guarding and protecting me from all evil. All this God does only because he is my good and merciful Father in heaven, and not because I have earned or deserved it. For all this I ought to thank and praise, to serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. And we'll read that one more time. Ready? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God made me in all that exists, and that he gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind, and all my abilities. And I believe that God still preserves me by richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, food and drink, property and home, spouse and children, land, cattle, and all that I own, and all that I need to keep my body and life. God also preserves me by defending me against all danger, guarding and protecting me from all evil. All this God does only because he is my good and merciful Father in heaven, and not because I have earned or deserved it. For all this I ought to thank and praise, to serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. All right. Now, for those of you at home, some of you have the materials. Others, we're going to get it in the mail probably Monday. Again, you can watch this as you want. What we're going to do now is write a quiz for the memory work. All right? And uh, if you don't have it, again, it'll be coming in the mail. And what you can do is just close your books and just take the quiz. If you want Mom and Dad with you to watch while you do it, fine. We're on the honor system here. Okay? So we'll take a break. Jaden is going to write it right now. And you can either pause if you'd like and write it, or you can leave it go. And hopefully, well, should be pretty close. The amount of time he takes to do it, probably pretty close to what uh, you will be taking to do it.
and I've got to do something, Jaden, while you're there. Okay? So I will be right back.
All right. Got it? All right. I'll take it. Thank you. All right. We'll wave. Okay. For those of you watching at home, if you paused and you're fast forwarding, trying to catch up to where we are, when I put my hand up like that, that's a sign that now we're starting lesson again. Okay? So we are on lesson. It's 143 to or 153 to 163. I believe we are on the middle of page one. Is at least that's where we're going to pick up here. Okay? All right. So we're going to take turns. Now you may not uh, hear Jaden as as he reads, but uh, I'll say the the passage, and then you can read along if you want. It should take about the same amount of time. All right. So we talked about. Where did we come from, right? And we use that example that uh, sometimes little kids ask where we come from and, uh, well, they're too young to explain the facts of life to them, so we come up with silly little stories. Well, sometimes even older people ask, where did we come from? How did we get here? And even older people sometimes come up with uh, silly stories. Well, we saw that the truth is God has made us out of nothing, by the power of his word in six normal days, right? And we talked about that. The word day, when used with a, with a number, first day, second day, third day, in the Hebrew language, always, without exception, means a 24-hour day. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit as we go. God created everything so that it was very good. And then Genesis 2, God picks up some things from Genesis 1 and expands on them. And one of the things he expands on is, well, how did human beings, where did human beings come from? Isaiah 45. Go ahead, Jaden. Maybe I'm going to pause one second. This is the class we had on October 28th, and of course the Wednesday class we repeat on Saturdays. This is Saturday. We're repeating that class. We're going to go as far as we went on Wednesday, so we'll all be uh, doing the same material at the same time. Okay? Pardon? Okay, you can pause for a second. Right there. All right. So go ahead. Oh, I, I, actually in the middle, Isaiah 45. It's all right. <coughs> all right. So what does God say through his prophet? Whoop. Hmm. I think I've gone forward too far. There we go. All right. That he tells us that he created human beings. Again, he tells us he did it on day six. In Genesis 2, he expands on that a little bit and says, here's how he did it. He made Adam first, and then, kind of interesting, he let Adam see that uh, he needed someone. Adam names all the animals and but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So he realizes, he leads Adam to see in his own, I need someone different from the animals. So then God, of course, puts him in the deep sleep, takes the rib, and forms the woman out of the man. So very special, the way God created both man and woman. Where did human beings come from? Genesis 1.27, my turn. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So interesting, and this is not said about any other creature, only human beings. God created them in his own image. And what does that mean? And people come up with oh, sometimes silly ideas of what that means years ago, saying, well, human beings stand upright. That's how they're like God. Well, other animals stand upright too. Grizzly bears can, certain apes uh, but what else do we remember? God is a spirit. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. He's a spiritual being. God doesn't have legs or arms. It's not like he stands. So when we talk about being in the image of God, it's not talking about something to do with our physical body. In what way were Adam and Eve like God in the beginning? Go ahead, Ephesians 4. Yeah, righteous and holy. 
God made the first man and woman in his image, that is holy. Adam and Eve were like God in this way. They were holy, they were without sin. They knew God's will, and they had the ability to follow God's will. Okay? They were holy, and they had the ability to stay holy. All right? Where did human beings come from? Genesis 1, 28. My turn again. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So another special blessing God gave. He put us in charge. All right? He, human beings are to be in, in control, in charge of, the, uni of the, the universe, the world. The world exists for us. Okay? Uh, we're not just like, again, animals evolved trying to survive and uh, as if we're no better than a dog or a cat. Okay, not to say, I mean, we like dogs and cats, but we have a position over them. So, and we can talk more about that. It, it's all right for us to uh, raise cattle and eat them, okay, or uh, raise chickens and eat them. God created them for us. So, God made man, the first man and woman, as holy people. Okay, you got that one? Now? Okay. God made the first man and woman as, his whole, as holy people, God's image, who were to rule over everything for him. Okay? Carrying on. Diagram time here. Diagram time. So, in his holy image... To rule over everything. All right? Okay, let's carry on then. And again, if we're going too fast with writing, you can always pause us. So where did each of us come from? Job 31. Go ahead. All right. Now, God normally works through natural means to give us life, eh? Uh, it, but it's still him who does that, okay? It's him who is, allows us to be conceived inside our mothers. And it's he who preserves us and helps us while we're inside our mothers. He allows us to be born alive and then to live. That's how he does it, but he's still the one who does it. So... God formed each of us in his or her mother's womb. And we'll carry on. Ecclesiastes. The dust returns to the ground it came from. The spirit returns to God who gave it. And this is talking about death. And we remember for us as human beings, there's two parts of us, right? Uh, the dust, well, God created the dust into a human body. So our body is made of dust. When we die, it'll return to dust. And then the spirit, another word here for soul. Each one of us has both a body and a soul. And what is the soul? What color is it? How much does it weigh? How much space does it take up? We don't know. All we know, it's the invisible life inside of us that will live on even after we die. Okay? Uh, the Bible talks about, again, that, that soul inside of us also, kind of like the, well, it's the person that's inside of us. And as long as my soul is inside my body, I am a living person. When my soul leaves my body, then my life is ended, and there's just only the body left without life. So God made each of us with both a body and a soul. Carrying on, Psalm 139, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, if you have an uncle who's a doctor, right, an MD, okay. And uh, doctors, nurses, they can go to school for a long time. There's 
I don't know what they know, obviously, but all the things, it takes a lot of years to learn all the intricacies of the human body, even all the things that have to happen just so that I can move my arm like that, the brain sending the, the message and then the, the nerves and the muscles all working together, okay? Uh, somebody said that there's literally miles of nerve endings inside of us, okay? Uh, we are truly unique. Each one of us is a wonderful creation, wonderful members, mind and abilities, the things the human mind can do. Somebody was saying years ago that they were trying to teach, uh, what is it, a chimpanzee or an ape, and they got it to uh, maybe they could recognize maybe 15, 20 words, okay? Uh, they would talk about how intelligent they are, but it's still no match for the human mind. And no animal is able to think creatively the way we do. That we can sit down and let's say, let's put words together. We can make a song or a poem. Eh? Uh, God has made us truly unique, wonderful, and special. Where did each of us come from? God formed each of us to be a wonderful human being. God formed each of us to be a wonderful human being. All right. Diagram time. Each of us in his or her mother's own womb with a body and a soul. Got it there? Okay, there you see it? Okay. Hopefully you at home see it. Each of us in his or her mother's womb with a body and a soul. And all of these things, again, you look at it and you realize, wow, it tells us, again, of God's magnificence that he could make us, each of us, in such a unique and spectacular way. All the different things that a human body has and can do. Wow. All right. So, oops, there, oh, sorry, it's kind of caught. I, now, I'm, you at home, I think, can see this, but ours, it's with, with wonderful members, mind, and abilities. With wonderful members, mind, and abilities. Those are the words. Um, you can't see it at home, but here, uh, the bottom words are being kind of cut off, okay? Again, all the more reason why we're looking at uh, updating our equipment, okay? So with wonderful members, mind, and abilities. And we talked a little bit about that, is as you get a little older now, one of the things you're going to be doing is just discovering what are the talents that are unique to me. What are the things I'm good at? What are the things I like to do? And again, especially during the high school years, you'll think about these things because you're going to start thinking about, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Oh, how am I going to get, uh, get a job? And of course, ideally, get a job that will fit with your talents and abilities. Now, we paused here for a second. But no, keep going. All right. But we're going to look at a handout here. And I'm going to read, comment. We're not going to read all of it. But it should be with the materials that, uh, that you've received. Okay? Now, what, if, what we've studied, of course, is denied. In fact, it is who? Vehemently denied, even attacked by uh, millions upon millions of people in the world. And uh, depending on where you go to high school uh, or when you go to university, there are going to be people who will, well, uh, not only attack this, 
but they may well attack you if they find out you believe this. Now we're going to start off with a quote here. It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. And then parentheses, wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. That's a quote from a man named Richard Dawkins, who formerly was a professor at Oxford University, which is considered one of the preeminent universities in the whole world. That's the attitude that many have. Now, the above statement presents the view that many have towards those who believe the words of Genesis 1 and 2, where God tells us that he created the universe and everything in it in six normal 24-hour days. Many consider the scientific evidence for evolution to be so overwhelming, clear, and undeniable. Uh, these people wonder how any person with reasonable intelligence cannot believe in evolution. Now, again, we're going to read part of this now and more later, but we'll continue on. And yet the truth is, not all reasonably intelligent people do believe in evolution. In fact, there are numerous scientists who believe that an intelligent cause brought about the complexity of our universe. For instance, would anyone believe that Mount Rushmore developed by random chance through erosion caused by wind and rain? The wind and the rain came just uh, appropriately enough so that all these crevices were created so that, wow, this looks like President Washington, eh? Uh, something that complex and intricate had to have been designed or made by some intelligent cause. And it was, of course. Many scientists have differing views regarding the origins of the universe. In fact, there is no agreement regarding the data about the origins of the universe in the scientific world. Also, there are more than a few doubts about evolution in the scientific world. Scientist William Dembski claims... The evidence, the evidence against the theory of evolution is becoming stronger all the time. So let's take time to consider some of the scientific evidence against evolution. Now, Christians have no quarrel with, which, with science, which is defined as systematized knowledge derived from observation, study, and experimentation carried on in order to determine the nature or principles of what is being studied. However, the theory of evolution is unscientific. True science is knowledge based on facts which can be observed and documented. Evolution is theory based on guesses. There again, nobody was here when the universe came into existence. They're all making guesses based on what they think might have happened. This is real science. Now, would you keep track? Every time I let go of this, I want you to write down whether or not it falls down. Okay? So here's the first time. Did it fall down? Second time. Did it fall down? Third time. Fourth time. In fact, every time we've observed this, right? Every time you let it go, it falls. Let's call it, let's call it gravity. Okay? That's science. You can observe it and you can document it. Scientists were not here to observe and document what happened. They're making guesses based on what they think may have happened. The second paragraph I'm just going to highlight here. Uh, well, no, I'll read part of it. Darwin's theory of evolution is based on speculation, which Darwin himself later admitted had no scientific basis or proof. Now, Christians have no quarrel with the observation that species adapt to their environment. However, there is no proof or, or record of one species ever changing into another. Even Darwin himself had to admit there are two or three millions of species on Earth, sufficient field, one should think, for observation. But it must be said today that in spite of all the efforts of trained observers, not one change of a species into another is on record. Uh, modern evolutionists have been no more successful. The fixity of species remains an insurmountable barrier to this day. There is no record. Oh, there you go. Okay. Jaden is just showing me his diagram here. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. 
There's no record of a species going. There is no record ever of a mouse becoming a dog. Okay? In fact, scientists, well, actually, I think it was uh, Darwin himself who said, evidence will be found in the fossil records. Well, they've discovered fossils, and again, no evidence that this has ever happened. The theory of evolution is also in complete disagreement with the basic law of biology, the law of biogenesis, or the concept that life comes from life. We're going to try something here. Oh, let's just do this. I have here a small piece of paper, all right? And I'm going to put it down. I'm going to put it down here. Right? Now, let's watch. Now, eventually, this little piece of paper is going to become a mouse. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Hmm. Um, years ago, they had a, uh, I forget the man's name, but he, he had authored books supporting evolution. And he was on, oh, that, now you guys won't remember this, but, uh, well, the TV show, now, I think now it's live with Kelly and whoever. It used to be live with Regis and Kathy Lee. And this man was on with Regis and Kathy Lee. And Kathy Lee asked him, well, a, a question about this. And the man just said, well, we just need more time. We just need more time. If you just wait long enough, like, uh, oh, 100 million years, then it'll start to become uh, a mouse or a dog. And no one's ever seen it happen, but you're just supposed to believe them. Finally, um, the theory of evolution often also creates many questions it cannot answer. Where did the original mass, the first bitter matter, come from? How did life originate? Where is the so-called missing link? One other one that we, we didn't include. Um, you know the birds and the bees, there are certain plants that cannot exist unless there's insects to pollinize them. Evolution says the, the plants existed millions of years before the insects. Well, that's impossible. If the insects weren't there at the same time as the plants, there's no way that they could be pollinized and continue to exist. And yet the evolution has said, well, we just have to assume that they survived anyway. All right, if you go to the top of page two, uh, Leander Kaiser, that's, that's that point that's just made there. Let's go to the second paragraph. For Christians, it is refreshing to hear this evidence. But at the same time, we know that God does not work through science to lead people to believe this truth. God works through the power of his word. With that in mind, let's allow the Bible itself to, pre to present its case and do its own convincing. Again, I won't read everything, but let's go to the next part. What does God say in his word? There are four passages we especially want to keep in mind when we consider what the Bible says about how the universe came into existence. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Important. God does not lie to us. He always tells us the truth. Now, there are any number of reasons why people want to say the Bible is not true. One of them is that, well, if the Bible is true, then they have to change the way they live, and they don't want to do that. The other is, if you want to believe in evolution, you either have to say the Bible is not true, or you have to figure out a way to just take the words in a way that's not how they're written. Just change the words, uh, distort the words, or say, well, they're just symbolic. Okay? God does not lie to us. He always tells us the truth. I'll read this paragraph. In his wisdom, God chose to use words to communicate his truth to us. By the miracle of verbal inspiration, God, reduced his cho God recorded his chosen words for us in the Bible. And when reading, reading the Bible, we understand and interpret the words according to their simple, normal meaning as dictated by their immediate context and in light of what the rest of the Bible says. When speaking of how the world came into existence, 
the words of Genesis 1 and 2 are very plain and clear. The language is very straightforward. Uh, various other passages in the Bible also state it very plainly. The one true God created the universe, including the world and all that it is in it, by the power of his word in six normal 24-hour days. Next passage. Okay. In fact, our God is in the heavens. He does everything that pleases him. And we make this joke sometimes, right? Where does a 2,000-pound elephant sit? All right. And what does the Almighty God do? Whatever he wants. And what did God do? He created the universe in such a way and has run the universe in such a way so that it appears the way it does today. Okay? Uh, God created all things just the way he wanted them to be. Throughout time, God has ruled and operated the universe in such a way that it functions and it appears as it does today. The entrance of sin into the world, the great flood, were events which God in particular used and worked through so the universe has the appearance that it has today. In his wisdom, God may have used his almighty power in other ways so that the universe appears and functions as it does today. God continues to use his power to keep the universe and all systems functioning in it as he wishes. God promises to continue to do this as long as the world endures. Perhaps we can give you an example. Okay? Uh, an artist creates a painting. He or she designs and crafts the painting according to his or her own wi wishes and ideas. On the canvas, the artist paints a farmer who looks to be 85 to 90 years old. In the same painting, the artist includes a barn that looks to be about 100 years old. Also in the painting, the artist paints a tree that has been cut down. The artist is so interested in painting with exacting detail that he or she even includes the rings on the tree. An observer uh, looks at the painting and hmm, there's over 150 rings. That tree must have been 150 years old. Well, the artist finishes the painting and immediately shows it to a few close friends. The, the, the finished painting itself is only a couple of hours old, but the farmer the barn, the tree, all appear to be much older than that. So they look that way because the artist created them to look that way. In the same way, when God created the universe and all that is in it, he gave all things the apparent age he wanted them to have. In addition, God has ruled and controlled the universe throughout history so that it appears and functions today the way he wants it to. Next passage, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. God calls on me to be humble before him. God has told us what we need to know. He has created the universe as he said in Genesis 1 and 2. He controlled the universe throughout the ages so that it functions and has the appearance it has today. He is not required to give me reasonable explanations for how or why he chooses to do things. He is God, and he has the power and the right to do anything he wants. He is God. I am his creature. He assures me that what he says is true, and he expects me to be humble before him and believe what he says. We're going to pause there, all right? And we're going to come back to this in a little bit. Let's go back to our study lessons. Okay, well, did you have a question? Pardon? Yeah, why? Okay. All right. Carrying on. Why don't we accept the theory of evolution that is taught by many people? Second Peter 3, 3 and 5. Go ahead, Jaden. All right. Uh, scoffers, they just, they don't want to believe it. Okay? They're bound and determined to believe what they want to believe. Okay? 
And so they say, the Bible can't be true because it contradicts what I want to believe. And they, say, and they try to make us look foolish. Now, um, we believe by faith that a supreme being created things. We weren't there. We're going to take his word for it. They say, well, nobody, was, th nobody has, was there when it happened, so you don't know when a supreme, what a supreme being did. So we've studied, you listen to us. We're smart. Well, who are we going to listen to? Scientists who are imperfect. They're human. They don't know everything. They've changed their uh, mind on various things throughout the years. They don't know. They only make guesses. Or are we going to listen to the Lord? So the people who teach evolution deliberately deny that God created the world. Okay? Um, yeah. They don't want to believe it. When people come up with their own ideas of how the world came into existence and they can praise themselves and say, look, see what I've done. Look at how smart I am. Hebrews 11.3 by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen is not made out of what was visible. It all, in the end, it goes down to faith. And both people who believe in creation and people who believe in evolution are operating by faith. An evolutionist says, well, we've got some scientific evidence and this is how we're interpreting it this is what we think happened, so we're, we're going to believe, we're going to trust that this is right. Um, and again, they're, they're not taking into account all the variables. Many of them won't even consider the fact that maybe a supreme being is there, or that maybe a supreme being uh, has engineered things so that uh, it appears to be the way it looks. Okay, They won't even consider that. This is what we think, trust us. And of course, the, the, some of the scientists, we're smarter than you, so listen to us. They want us to just put our faith in them. Um, we put our faith in God. They can't prove what they believe. They can give scientific evidence to a point, but they weren't there to observe and document and know for sure. They're making guesses based on their research. And I can't prove what the Bible says is true, but I go back to the resurrection, which proves Jesus is the Son of God. His words are true. His words are in the Bible, so I will believe those words. And God has said he does not lie to us. Okay? In the end, we're both putting our faith in something. Our faith is in the Lord, their faith is in their own research, in themselves. Why, so, why don't we accept the theory of evolution? We don't accept the theory of evolution because those who teach it stubbornly deny what we know by faith. They stubbornly deny what we know by faith. They stubbornly deny what we know by faith. They stubbornly deny what we know by faith. Those who teach it stubbornly deny what we know by faith. 
kind of interesting. This man we talked about at the beginning, um, Richard Dawkins, his idea of how life started in the world, he said green people from another galaxy came and inhabited the world and they're the ones who started human life. And we're supposed to believe him because he's smart. We're not supposed to think he's crazy because he's supposedly smart. And yet they think we're crazy for believing a supreme being. God created us in a unique and special way. Okay? One other thought. If you deny evolution, and people will say, what's the big deal? But if evolution is not true, then Genesis 1 and 2 are not true. And if Genesis 1 and 2 are not true, are not true then Adam and Eve did not exist. If Adam and Eve did not exist, then Jesus did not descend from them. So uh, we can't believe that Jesus is the one God promised. Eh? Uh, if you believe evolution, ultimately you believe that sin is just a normal thing because that's what happens. And death is normal. In fact, we need death so that evolution can continue, so that things in the universe can get better and better. And so therefore, for the promotion of the evolutionary process, sometimes we need to get rid of certain people. So it just leads to all kinds of troubles and problems. Diagram. The unbeliever says, no, God didn't do it. The believer says, yes, God did it all for me. God did it all for me. <clears throat> God did it all for me. The word's for me. Okay. All right. Show why this statement is true. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in creation. What do you think? All right. Very quickly. Oh. Okay. Not millions of years. Yeah. Science, di in so many ways, disproves evolution. So it takes faith to say, oh, um, we have to believe all this stuff that science says couldn't happen, eh? We say, I have faith in a God who can do anything. People who believe in evolution, rather than the Bible's account of creation, have a whole different view of human life. See? If evolution is true, then we're nothing more than glorified animals. And just as animals will kill to survive, then we should have every right to kill to survive. If we're nothing more than glorified animals, well, what do we do with animals who are not wanted? Okay? What, yeah, okay? What do you do if you have too many cats on the farm? Okay? Or uh, what do you do when a horse breaks its leg? See? Evolution cheapens human life. You don't value people as special creations of God to be cared for because God wants us to love people, and make sure they all have saving faith in Jesus. So what does the Bible tell us about God's creation of the universe? God created the universe and everything in it, including me, by his almighty power. By his almighty power. <coughs> God created the universe and everything in it, including me, by his almighty power.
All right, we want to go about oh, five or six more minutes. So uh, we want to hurry here get to catch up with everybody. So the other thing, many evolutionists say God was not involved, and then they ultimately deny God. And when you take God out of the picture, there's no one to watch over us and take care of us. So, and God does take care of us. We talk about uh, parents and families, how they... I think you're a little too far there, okay? How about where, right where you are, uh, up top of the page on your right hand? No, to your right. I think we're going to start there, okay? God uses families to protect us and provide for us. What does our Heavenly Father do to take care of us? Go ahead, Matthew 6. Yeah, God provides us with what we need. Okay, he's done it throughout time. Uh, he, he cares, we are the crown of his creation. Jesus says if he cares about uh, animals and plants, you can be sure even more so he cares about you. Matthew 26, or Matthew 6, 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? Yeah. If God takes care of the plants, we can be sure he takes care of us, and he gives us the clothing that we need. In fact, uh, much more than we need, right? You know, people look at a closet and they just can't make up their mind which which shirt should I wear, or which dress, or which shoes? We have so much to choose for. Second Corinthians, go ahead. Okay. God will give us all that we need. All we need, always. He'll make sure we have it. So, what does God, what does our Heavenly Father do to provide for us? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. God, our Heavenly Father, will prov provides for us with all that we need every day. Go ahead. God the Father provides all with provides us with all that we need every day. God the Father provides provides us with all that we need every day. All right. So, carrying on, with time we're not going to read all this. I think... We're the story of the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus performed a miracle. Five loaves of bread, two fish, and he fed, well, there are 5,000 men we know, and then the women and children besides. It could have been 10, 12,000 people. It's a miracle. And God can do miracles when he wants, eh? He can provide for us in ways that can't be explained, right? But normally, God serves us, provides for us through natural means. Psalm 104, go ahead. <coughs> yeah, normally uh, he works through natural means, right? Uh, in the spring we can plant and then he provides sunshine and rain in the summer and the fall. People, some are still harvesting. A, then we have food then to survive. And then for most of us, he gives us talents and abilities, and then we can do honest work. And with honest work, we can make money. And with the make money, we can buy the food that's been growing. That's how God normally does things. So how does God provide for us? 
While God can provide for us through miracles, he usually does so just by making things grow. While God can provide for us through miracles, he usually does so just by making things grow. He usually does so just by making things grow. All right, diagram then. Food and drink. Oops. And I'll have to read the ones on the bottom there. Food and drink. Okay. Food and drink. All we need always <coughs> and then underneath you have clothing on the left, clothing, and again that's cut off, and on the right it's making things grow. making things grow. And that's making things grow. That's where we're going to stop, okay? Uh, you should have the sheet with the memory work for next time. Most of it is a repeat, although we're going to switch now and work on the fourth commandment, but you have the same passages for review, Genesis 1, Exodus 20, the same Bible books, and the first article. All right? So there you go. Mm -hmm. And let's close with a prayer. All right. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for revealing to us how you made the world and how you care for us. Work in our hearts so that we will always believe in you and trust that you don't lie to us. You always tell us the truth. Help us to trust you will care for us always. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Okay. All right.